Okay, so this one. All right, inshallah, it's 8 05, so let's begin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I pray this reaches you all well and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you all safe. I pray you are able to hear me. I see my audio is going through, so inshallah ta'ala will continue on on that path. I see a check mark, Jazakallah khair. Thank you again, Jazakallah khair, for joining. Um, give me just one minute so I can send this link uh, to someone, and then we are good to go. Alright, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, bil alamin, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alayhi wa sallam. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Everyone, I pray you are all doing well and Allah subhanahu is keeping you safe. And may Allah subhanahu keep us all safe and inshallah connect us back to the masjid where we can attend, us see each other and uh, in God say salam, you know, in person. And may Allah subhanahu let us continue our regular routines, I mean, soon, inshallah ta'ala. Without further ado, we'll jump in. The important of today, the topic itself is sincere actions and intentions. And subhanAllah, there are no, there's no, there are no other topics that I can think are more important than these, and you'll see why, and alhamdulillah, the slides, inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about it. So without further ado, I wanna jump in to one of the stories. Uh, actually, before that, I want to jump into this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So know therefore who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, and then seek forgiveness. This is, by the way, 101 in Aqidah that we learned that before anything, we should know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. That connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be very clear. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it mandatory for us to have understanding of who Allah is before we even ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. such an important verse to understand because it, un it gives us the ability to prioritize. We must prioritize of what we do. And in worship, things do get prioritized. When the time comes of salah, if you're reading Quran, the preference of that or the priority is salah. If there's something happening and the salah time or any prayer time or the worship time or the time of that particular Worship is uh, is uh, uh, is active at that time. You do what the worship entails. So this is very important. The prioritization, which is something you will see, alhamdulillah, we all struggle with that prioritization. Like we can sometimes we have a very hard time prioritizing uh, uh, among our tasks and seeing which one we should do first and such. But subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa taala, our Creator, prioritizes gives us a lesson of prioritization. We know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and then repent. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to learn more about him and then accept our forgiveness. I wanted to start the story of intention with, uh, or this uh, presentation of intention with a story of a worshiper. And this story is of in Bani Israel. And the story starts with a worshiper who is an abid. He is one of the greatest worshiper in this town of how many people. And of course, you know, he's making his dua. He is make, he's fasting on Mondays and Thursdays on the odd, the, the 14th, 15th. And the, um, he's making his dhazkar. He's doing everything by the book and more. And he's doing everything he could, inshallah ta'ala, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is always on point about it. And the life goes on and everybody knows about him and this worshiper. And then subhanAllah, one day comes out that they get to know that there is this, in, uh, there is this tree that the, the villagers are now starting to worship it. So this tree was on top of this mountain. And because of the way the tree looked, um, people started worshiping this tree. And subhanAllah, being the worshiper he was, and he knows the importance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the worship that should be only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wanted to do something about it. So he said, you know what? I have to do this myself. I will go and chop down the tree. 
so people will not commit the shirk they don't commit these errors in in the in the servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he picks up whatever the axe he has of course he's not that rich right because he's a worshiper um, most of the time when it is true those who are very very religious they kind of you know um, the their livelihood is about halakas and such so they're not as rich so he's not like he doesn't have all the fancy so he just grabs whatever he has an axe or whatever and he goes or a sword he has and he goes towards the tree to go and chop it so he's going towards the tree and he gets to the tree and subhanallah he's met by a man and lo and behold that man is no other than shaitan himself but in a shape of a human being and he comes and he said hey 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 what are you doing what are you doing what are you trying to do and the worshiper responds back to shaitan and says i am going to chop this tree he's like why it's like people are worshiping this and they should only worship allah subhanahu wa one and only subhanallah he says this and the shaitan is now you know making excuses like you know what if you just come chop this tree people will start worshiping the other tree there's so many other trees or they'll find something else to worship and at this point, you know, the argument is happening and the worshiper is like, now I'm not having any of this. So he said, I'm going to continue and still go and chop that tree. So he goes, take the axe and then start uh, about to uh, chop the tree. But then Shaitan comes in and is like, you know what? No, I'm not going to let you go and chop the tree. Instead, let's have a match. Let's wrestle. And whoever wins, they can do whatever they wish. And of course, you know, he's in a mission, on a mission to cut down this tree. So he's like, yes, let's do it. And they started wrestling. And lo and behold, who wins is the, the Abid. He's a worshiper who is a worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wins the match. And Shaitan has now lost. Now Shaitan has to think about this. Like, what do I do? I just lost this. So he comes up with this idea that instead of you know he can't now persuade him and look at how this tactic of shaitan man it's so deep so devious right and he's like i can now persuade him how about i instead how about i instead uh make it make uh, uh make him a deal so he tells him how about this you let go of this tree just for today or days for uh, following just let go of this tree Instead, this is what I will do. I will, every single day, that you don't come back to cut off this tree, I will personally put one dirham under your pillow. I will personally put one dirham under your pillow. And he's very poor, right? The worship is very poor. And just let go of this tree. And you will get paid for it. Or, and you know, I'll take care of whatever is, was happening and such, and I'll take care of it. Just do this for now and just go and, uh, and just let go. The worshiper thinks about it. He thinks about, you know, subhanAllah, I'm very poor. You know, having these two dirham or one dirham will make a big difference. And also shaitan promises something, which is again, you will say, you know, just money. Why would I just get the money and just be done with it? said, listen, this is another thing I'll tell you. You like to worship. And have you noticed that everybody annoys you all the time? How about this? I'll add to this. That nobody will come and bother you. You will stay at home. Nobody will annoy you. So you do your thing. You do worshiping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you want. Alone, private time, solitude. You'll get the money so you never have to work again. Never have to deal with someone else. You should be living a good life. Subhanallah, now subhanallah, look at shaitan is now paying him to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's so crazy. Look at this, the plan that he's uh, devising. And he and the sh he thinks, the worshiper thinks, he's like, you know what? It's not a bad deal. It's just a tree and I get to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why not? So he takes that offer and he goes back home. And of course, he's hungry. You know, the a lot of things are happening in his mind. So he goes home, goes to sleep. The next day comes. And of course, he finds that one dirham that he was promised and all is good he does not go to that tree no chopping is happening today everything all right next day comes goes to sleep wakes up looks at it and there's still that one dirham that he was promised and it's all good third day comes 
He goes to sleep, wakes up, and there's no dead home anymore. And of course, he is now furious. The worshiper is like, what is this? I just promise you dead home every day. What's happened? And again, we know, you know, shaitan is, is always going to be a liar for us. He will never speak the truth, no matter what, he, what we do. And subhanAllah, at this point, he gets so furious. He takes his axe of worshiper and he goes toward the tree like today, I am going to chop it off no matter what. So again, the same scene happens. He goes towards the tree, all furious with his axe, you know, really angry and all this stuff. But I, but I want you to, to just look at how is anger this time compared to the previous one. His anger now that he has, is it for his own purpose or is it for the sake of Allah? So now he comes to the tree and he again finds shaitan in the shape of a human being and they do the same conversation and now it's time to wrestle uh if they wrestle and this time the believer the worshiper ends up losing and this baffles the believer he's like how can this happen we just had a match the other day two days ago i beat you you were not even close how did you win and subhanallah, Iblis is now, you know, teaching him this. It's like, because the last time you came, you did it for purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this time, you didn't come for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You did it because of your own anger and the money you wanted. And that's, subhanallah, is so crucial that if we're trying to find success in this life, we can always find success when the, our intentions are clear and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's any other way, this is exactly what's going to happen to us, that we will lose. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, we wanted to jump in. Again, the concept of sincerity, and we'll have more stories, right? The story also of um, how Musa alayhi salam and his intentions and how he, um, when he was, he was exiled, he was running away from uh, Pharaoh and he comes to this tree and he looks up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, Ya Allah, I am a faqir, I have nothing, I am a faqir, I have nothing. And that sincerity, that ikhlas he had in there, in his heart at that time, subhanAllah, look at it, it was so powerful of Musa alayhi salam, that this man had nothing. He was abandoned, he was alone, he had no family, he had no money, his clothes were, you know, almost, there was not all patches and such, it was done, he was running around scared, no protection, no safety, nothing. And subhanAllah, with that perfect sincerity, with that perfect ikhlas, with that pure intention, when he says, Ya Allah, I am a faqir, I have nothing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him. Blesses him what? He blesses him, he gets a job. Right after that, what happened in the story? He gets a job. He gets job security. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his father-in-law promises him for a good amount of years, six, seven years, now he has job security. He also gets to get married. He also gets to be the shepherd. He also gets this honor in the family, in the, in the community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take this man who had zero network to now one of the most prominent people in that town. And that all has to do with sincerity. And this also relates to us today, which is something that many of the successful people will say, you know, these type of stories. Like if you want something bad, you want to be sincere about it. And one of the examples that somebody gives, right? This, uh, this young man comes to this older gentleman who's very successful, very rich and such, and says, can I please learn from you? I want to learn from you. I want to be as successful as you. Please tell me, how can I be as successful as you? Please tell me. And he said, okay, you want to know? All right, tomorrow, meet me at this place, which is a, a beach they had. Meet me at this place, and you will not ask me any questions. Just come and learn. All right, next day comes in the morning, they meet up the, the, the designated spot and the old gentleman tells them, okay, let's go inside uh, into the water. They go into the water and they keep going and going. The water is coming up and up. And this young man is like, what is this guy doing? I want to get rich. I don't want to get drowned. 
And at one point, this old man, this older gentleman takes that young man and then dips him in the water. Takes him, grabs him by the shirt and dips him in the water. Again, that young man is like suffering, right? Struggling to get that breath. And he's like, what is this? I want, you know, he's struggling, he's struggling. Putting, moving his hand around and such, whatever he can do to, you know, just get him come back out. And then he, the old man lifts him back up. And the young man is definitely very angry. He's like, what is wrong with you? Like, you're trying to kill me. And he says, the old man says, like, how did you feel? It's like, what do you mean how I felt? He says, how much did you want to breathe at that time? It's like, I would have done anything. I don't even want your richness for this one. I would have done anything for that breath. It's like, until you have your goals in life, the way you want to breathe at that moment, you will never succeed. And subhanAllah, I connect this with intentions. I connect this with the ability for us to be that sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until we're that sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with our actions that we're trying to do, with our intentions, we will always go 90%, 80%. That 100% will never be achieved. And this is inshallah ta'ala today uh, for this discussion. And then of course, by the fattest, we'll also continue this discussion for us. Um, we want to open this discussion for everybody. Uh, they can use the chat or unmute themselves. We'd love some, uh, definitely some engagement. If you were to say, if the question is, what is the class and sincerity for you? And how are we sometimes forget to prioritize it in our daily lives? Um, so the first question again, what is the class and sincerity for you? And how are we able to sometimes forget about how to prioritize it? Excuse the grammar about it. So we'll open, please share uh, your comments. Fadis, please share your um, reflection as well, my dear brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody. Thank you, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Mr. 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 Thank you, um, so uh, Hassan was covering ikhlas and I, I really do, th those stories really do reflect ikhlas. It's, it's like a whole submission, right? It's like giving every single bit an ounce for the sake of what you're doing. And the example that Hassan gave about the one who was drowning is probably the most eye opening, vivid example. The, the, uh, the want to breathe is a very weird sensation. Like if you're getting choked, if you're drowning, if you've ever felt that, the want to breathe, that moment where it hits you, and you're like, oh no, I can't breathe right now and I need to breathe. That wanting for it should be the same want or should be the same type of feeling that you feel when you're doing any worship or anything for the sake of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and every single action, and this is why, subhanAllah, this is, this is why on the day of judgment, our deeds are not counted. Allah doesn't count how many times our salah. Allah doesn't count how many times we do things. Allah weighs our deeds. The weight of the deed is what matters. And what does the weight of the deed reply, uh, rely on? The weight of the deed relies on the sincerity, the closeness, the intention of that deed. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that the best deeds are the ones that are small and they are consecutive. Why is it consecutive? Because when you do one thing at one time, it doesn't train you to have this ikhlas for Allah. Like if you pay $100,000 at one time, it's harder for you to get the intention that this is 100% for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you only did it one time and that was it. That was $100,000 and it's a big sum of money. Um, and it's easier to have your intention skewed with a bigger deed. Now with a smaller deed, like let's say you pray two rak'ah after, after, two rak'ah after Aisha every single day. Or you just pray two rak'ah every day in the middle of the day because that's some habit that you had. Or you pay $10 a day because that's a habit that you had. Now, no one's going to ask you about this habit. It's $10. It's something so small, so insignificant in your eyes. But in the eyes of Allah, 
since this is so insignificant to you or since you're be, not belittling it, but you're minimizing the, the deed, that sincerity that you have through that deed is very, very, very heavy. And this is what Allah weighs on the Day of Judgment. Those deeds are the deeds that take us, inshallah, may Allah grant us all Jannah, will take us into Jannah. What do you think, Jazakallah uh, Khair how do you think we living our lives today, and again, please, everybody, use the comment sections or unmute yourself, that how we forget to prioritize this, like what is happening in our lives, and sometimes we just forget about it. Like what are those factors, vices, that we sometimes indulge in, that we forget to prioritize ihsan or ikhlas, or not ihsan, ikhlas sincerity. Tell me, what do you think? Or Faris, it could be anyone, inshallah. What I was going to say is um, something that's very, very, very big and something that's very, I think, a huge advice, especially in our times, is the want to share every single thing that you're doing. We see people... On social media? On social media, yeah. On social media. Share everything that you do on social media. Um, like, we see people who go to the masjid and they want to post that. Or they're reading Quran one time and they want to post that. Or they... I'm not saying that they're doing this for those people, right? A right, lot, so a you're lot saying their it intention. could happen, right? It could sway their... The thing is, we want to achieve that perfection in the, in the deed. Now, when you right. post it somewhere, this might sway your intention without you realizing it. Because the, the Sahaba, radiallahu anhuma, even Umar ibn Khattab, one of the greatest Sahaba, right? one of the Khulafat al-Rashidin, one of the rightly guided predecessors, he would ask one of the companions who knew who all the hypocrites were, Hudayfa ibn Yamana, he would ask him, Hudayfa, am I one of the hypocrites? Because he doesn't even know how much ikhlas he has. Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second greatest human being after the prophets. Oh. This person, he was afraid that his sincerity is not enough. He, he was afraid that he was a, not just that his sincerity was not enough, that he was a hypocrite. Right. So this is this something very eye-opening is that we should, if, since we should always check our intention and mitigate all other variables that will intrude on the perfection of the intention. Um, I have a question regarding what Faris just said. So uh, Faris said, you said that, you know, um, swaying your intention, if you're going to the masjid and your intention is swayed because you want to post it on social media, I mean, is it not, does obviously the value of going to the masjid is still there, correct? Like, it's not like your salah is less right. because you want it to go. No, no, of course I, not. Right, I wanted to correct. So that's why I had this verse open, right? Indeed, Shaitan is an enemy to you, so take him as an enemy. And I will couple this with that mankind was created weak. Human beings were created weak. Um, that's a very good point because you have to put those two together. Um, social media, like I know some of the youth, subhanAllah, are now praying because their friends are praying. So let's say you have a friend who doesn't pray and you go into the masjid and showing them praying on social media, it kind of is like, man, Amir is praying, or Fadis is praying, Ahmud is praying, Zisunda is praying, and, you know, Yusha is praying. Like, I want to pray too, right? Like, I don't want to be that left out. I don't want to left, be left out. And I've seen, actually, within Masjid Salam, a lot of the youth, mashallah, are praying because of their friends. So there are two ways you can use social media. I think what uh, Fadis, mashallah, ta'ala, also, it's the idea of... Uh, there's a hadith of Allah, you know, a person who gives charity that their right hand doesn't know, or the left hand doesn't know what the right hand gave. There is a concept of being so humble about it, which is the very high level, which is the prophetic level, mashallah, that you don't even know. Like if you're giving charity, your left hand doesn't know what the right hand is gave. So there is that aspect of it. The other aspect is to do khayr, which is, by the way, if you do khayr for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you do it perfectly the way you're doing it. And if you change it, then you're doing it out of fear of, of, of people, then that is also a sin itself. You, got to say, you know, I, mashallah, read surah al or this surah and this surah and this 
and I read these long surah, but out of fear of people, we're going to change the way I do it, or this, or you reduce, then also that is a sin. If you were the other way around, if you were to increase something just because somebody is watching and you, mashallah, go, Alhamdulillah, and this and that, that also is comes into, you know, you're doing it for who? I would, uh, I think what's the best approach to that particular scenario is to just check your intentions. And when you put in social media, that means you have to check your intention even more. Yes, Faris, I think that would be not that the intention, like most of the time we are, because the moment you make wudu and going to salah, you have intention to go pray, man. It's like, you know, when people say make intention to go salah, the moment you make wudu or you're driving to the masjid, what else do you have an intention of? Going to meet a friend or something? Most of the, uh, you're going to go and pray and such. So that's very important. I think social media poses a new challenge for us, especially our time, is that because sometime what happens, let's say you post this co comment and people like it, and that likes go up and up and up, shaitan can come to you and say, yo, mashallah, man, you are praying five times a day. People know about it. You should be this, you should be that. And it reminds me of a story of Imam uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who was on his deathbed. And he's, you know, he's passing, he's going through the Sakhrat al-Maut, which is the, the, the death and the, the stages of that and how the soul and everything is happening. And at one point he is unconscious and he started, and his son is next to him. And he started saying, not yet, not yet, not yet. For someone who's dying and saying not yet, not yet, what would you think? Because there is a narration that the soul that is an evil soul would actually not want to get out of your body. SubhanAllah, it's a long hadith of how the soul goes up and down when the person passes away. And he does that the soul, they don't want the soul to come out of their body. So he's afraid, his son is now worried. Like my father, who's such a great scholar, one of the four scholars, right? Ahmed the Humble, is going through this. SubhanAllah, when he, he, he comes back to consciousness, and um, his son asked him, oh, my father, what happened? You said not yet, not yet. Ahmad ibn Hanbal said, and look at it. This man is a scholar. This guy is one of the best we have in Islamic sciences and such, and the jurisprudence and such in fiqh. And he said this. It's like shaitan came to me and gave me waswasa. And he says, oh, Ahmad, I lost you. You won. I lost you. And he said, not yet. Not yet, not until I am in Jannah, I meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not until that moment I haven't won. Because at that moment, if he would have said, yes, I won, he took the credit that Allah allowed him to win to that I won. So I think that's what type of level that we are pushing ourselves to. Correct, Faris? And I mean, does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I wasn't talking about like the fiqhi ruling of having the intention to make the salah. I was talking about why you're making the salah, right? Or a, a better way to put this is like, yeah, why? The reason why? Or for what you're doing this for? Or for <clears throat> who you're doing it for? Yeah, Alhamdulillah, ikhlas is one of the very important part, right? In, um, in the, the hadith of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he repeats ad din al um, the deen is sincerity. The deen is sincerity. Deen al nasiha and sincerity. Nasiha also is advice that's in that particular hadith is in sincerity. The, the entire deen is about sincerity. It's being sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the forgiveness also, right? Your deeds are forgiven. So you're sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have two hadiths that actually talks about this. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that intentions, uh, actions are judged by intention. There are two hadiths about this. One, actions are judged by intentions. Whoever uh, travels or migrate for the sake of you know, marriage or work, that's uh, there. they will get the reward of that. The person who does this and that. It's a beautiful hadith about it, right? But uh, the, the hadith itself, subhanAllah, is very clear. The action will be judged at the end of the day based on your intentions. And the other hadith that kind of completes it is that actions are judged by its completion. So you can have a terrible Ramadan in the beginning. And the end, you get your contention corrected. And then how it completes, also Allah will reward you for it. So Allah, how merciful he is. 
So if your intention was okay in the beginning, and then let's say in the middle it kind of fall apart, Allah would reward you for the first ones. Like first 15 days, you were all good, but then you, mashallah, people loved you so much, and you're, you're one of the Tarawi reciters, and you know, your recitation, everybody's like, mashallah, beautiful recitation, and Shaitan comes in and kicks in, you know, your ego and whatever, and our vices and our insecurities, and that kicks in, and then we're now like, you know, no, I have a beautiful voice, mm -hmm. and it, you know, goes into our mind, and we started thinking about it. Then Allah would reward you for the first few days, and then, of course, the next one is based on your intention. Now, let's say your first 15 days were terrible, Ramadan. And the last 15 days were the best, and you got yourself together. There was a beautiful recitation about one of the surahs. Like, one of the time for me, Yusuf alayhi salam, um, I was having a terrible Ramadan. My beginning of Ramadan was not the best. Um, and subhanAllah, one of the chapters I really love, which is with Yusuf, sort of Yusuf. And that day, Muhammad Jibril, one of the very popular uh, Quran, uh, they came and he started reciting. And he recited the verse from Surah Yusuf. And that was so powerful for me that I, you know, it was just 180. And I ended Ramadan so strong, it was just amazing. And Allah would reward you for that. So actions are judged either by intention or completions. Um, and Allah will judge you accordingly based on both. Any questions on that end? No, it's not like um, everybody. So I was just going to comment on that um, because something I was thinking about. So when I first started practicing, you think about it, we have to fast, pray and whatnot. And sometimes, you know, people can think this is the hardest thing we have to do. But then when you think about sincerity, actions, that's actually the most important, which is what we're going to be judged on at the end of the day, like our worship, charity, any good deed. So it all kind of ties into that. So regardless of prayer, fasting, those are things we have to do, but you just have to think about how your sincerity ties into it. Does everybody can see exactly like I just said, and getting sincerity ties into it, especially, you know, it's, um, it's very easy to miss it, right? Would you agree? I guess it's one of the easiest things you can just like, you know what, I just don't remember. Everybody can see the par the PowerPoint? Yeah, we can see it. It was going through the pages, but okay. now it's good. Yes, That's yes. Okay. Anyone else wants to add something? Okay, Bismillah then, we'll continue. Um, again, we talk about why our intention is so important. And this is a very important topic of, on its own, why our intention is so important. Um, and how ikhlas, why our intention is so important, why are, what are the, some benefits of having an intention even when the action never came to fruition, which is one of the examples with Ramadan. And we talked about it, What? why our intention is so important. Everybody got the the two hadiths, yes. So we covered that portion. I will also quote one of the verses from Surah Al-Kahf that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, shall we not, shall we not uh, inform you of the greatest losers?" So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is, you know, it's very interesting. Something I recognize that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala calls people losers, and of course, even the prophets like. Um, uh, Prophet Adam salam, when they were exiled or they were kicked off from Jannah um, and Allah subhanahu wa told them to descend to the earth and and uh, or the different narration that we have um, it's also their Allah we have wronged ourselves and if you were not to forgive us we will be among the losers it's very interesting that that lingo is so prevalent today that we have of today and today's time that we really the word loser and such. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to uh, Rasulullah sallallahu say, oh Muhammad, shall we not inform you of the greatest loser as to their deeds? SubhanAllah is mentioning who are the greatest loser to their deed. And at this point we say, who are them? Ya Allah, tell us, we want to know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the next verse, they are those whose effort is lost in the worldly life while they thought that they were doing all well. 
subhanAllah, could be that on the day of judgment, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has us all come and we're like, man, we did charity, we did this, we did that, and all is great, and we come in, and then that day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negate every single thing that we've done because we did it for someone else, and there's a hadith about it as well. Faris, would you like to share that one? Or the three individuals will go to hell, will be in the hellfire first? Please? Yeah, so um, uh, in a very eye-opening hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us of three people who will be the first ones in hellfire. So before anybody else, they're the ones who start the fire uh, on the day of judgment. So um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us of three people. The, the first person is a person who is a qari. He's a qari. He's a person who reads Quran or an alim, a person who's knowledgeable in Quran. And he reads Quran and that's what he does. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment is taking him to hellfire, he's asking Allah, Allah, I, I was reading all this Quran for you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And just imagine this with us for a second. The day of judgment is the most stressful day ever. It's going to be the most stressful day ever. You're in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows every single thing that you've done. Imagine walking in front of like the principal or your boss at work or your professor and you've done something bad. Imagine that times infinity. That's the stress that you're having when you're talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about your deeds on the day of judgment, right? So the sun is super close to you. You're sweating. There's a bunch of people around you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you a liar. He says, Kazabit, you're a liar. He says, you didn't do, you didn't read all this Quran for me. You read it so people could say, oh, wow, what a beautiful voice this guy has. So he told, he tells the angel to take him and throw him into hell. And then the second person, I don't know if these are in a specific order, but the second person in my, in me relaying it to y'all is a person who gave a lot of charity. This person gave so much charity and on the day of judgment, he thinks that he's going to be one of the winners. But he said, while the angels are taking him to hell, he's telling Allah, Ya Allah, why, why are you taking me to hell? I gave, you, I gave all of this wealth in your sake, Ya Allah. And Allah, again, tells this man he's a liar. He tells this man he's a liar. And he tells him, you did it for, so people could say, wow, look at this person, mashallah, giving all this money. So take him and throw him into hellfire. And the third person is the one who did jihad fi sabilillah. He went and he fought in the cause of Allah and died on the battlefield. A shaheed, quote unquote, of course. A shaheed, someone who gave their life. They went and they fought. They died. They left back all their family. And even in this, in that hardest time, people could be so away from their intention that they would die for something other than Allah at that point. So he says, oh Allah, I died for your sake. I was a shaheed. I was one of the martyrs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, he says, you're a liar. You died so people could say, oh wow, look at this person who died for the sake of Allah. In his death, he worried about what people were saying about him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells him, he tells the angels to take him and throw him into the hellfire. And these will be the three people that ignite the fire of Jahannam on the day of judgment. May Allah protect us all. May Allah protect us all. Yeah. And I want to quickly play the verse itself because I think we should hear them. A few plays. I guess not. Sad. All right, it's fine. We having. Technical glitches. So we'll go back to inshallah ta'ala our uh, presentation and finish it inshallah ta'ala. I don't want to take you all time. So what are the intentions? Why this intention is important? We just mentioned this now. Some of the benefits we also mentioned. Ramadan is one of them. Um, for example, by the way, let's say if you, I'll give you the even bigger example. Those who were going to Umrah in March, alhamdulillah, we had 81, 82 people had planned to go and then COVID-19 happened. And they couldn't go. And some of them are here. So let's not make it easy for y'all. And that's, I mean, um, subhanAllah, 
you know, I I shared with them at that time as well. One time I had some issues where I couldn't travel and my passport and all this stuff weren't going through and I couldn't get a visa. And I remember just giving them a ride, the team that were going to a uh, four hour ride from where we were to the airport, the international airport. So I gave them a four hour ride to the airport. And subhanAllah, the day, I was pretty sad, right? I'm giving them, I'm working, you know, my, you know, I'm helping them get to the airport where they're going to go to Umrah, but they're going to leave me and then I'm going to go back home uh, for our drive alone and all this stuff. So I'm just thinking about, you know, all that work. I'm like, I really want to go to Umrah and I don't end up going, but they're going Alhamdulillah. But subhanAllah, look at it. See, the intention is so powerful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed, um, Allah allowed me to look at uh, the day, uh, the same day, subhanAllah, I had a dream and I was dreaming that I was walking into the haram. And it was such a powerful dream that subhanAllah, I was so happy about it afterwards. I don't care at that time. And this is not the best of the stories that I have. I have one of the most important stories in my life that changed my life. It was one statement I said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took that intention of it. And Allah awarded me being able to go to Hajj every year as a group leader, alhamdulillah. And that was one statement I said with that intention in my mind, in my heart, and it had to do with charity. So I say this not to boost myself. Again, Allah gave me the money to give charity. It's not something I own. I, someone was struggling with their rent and I had some money left to go to Umrah and I was planning to go to Umrah in December. And that person, and I was wondering, what do I do? Should I give the money to the brother? and let go of Umrah and what do I do? And subhanAllah, and after this is after years of getting the visa and all this stuff. So we had a lot of struggle. There were some issues with the passport, but anyhow, all the thing now alhamdulillah is all done. But at that time it took me a long, like five, six years I'm leaving the country. And it was that moment. And subhanAllah, imagine the pressure and being want to be in Umrah. And I'm now recently reverted to, right? We grew up as Muslim, but we never are Muslims. We never understand what being a Muslim is. So at the age that a few years before that, I became really practicing and understanding the Quran is more than the Quran and all this stuff. So this is happening. So I really want to go and connect now. And subhanAllah, this individual comes and then this individual, long story short, I end up giving him the money. And I remember going to my teacher and saying, you know what, I will let go of Umrah now. And I said this to him, I remember this verbatim. I said this to him, then inshallah ta'ala, I will do Umrah during Hajj. And I gave what I had to that person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed, accepted that deed and allowed me to go to Hajj that year. I also went to Umrah in December as well. If you talk about intentions and charity combined, this is the importance of intentions. Not only that I got one thing that I wanted to do, Allah gave me even more that I was able to go to a Hajj after that year every year. SubhanAllah. Intentions changes the way it is. And SubhanAllah, one of the reasons that also helped was, one, I was helping my Sheikh, who was the group leader, who was an imam of the group, and he, he took me under his uh, wing and made me a group leader. And subhanAllah, people now want my position in my community, in Raleigh community, in this community, well, both of my communities. Um, in that, or in Raleigh community, people want that position. And subhanAllah, I remember I used to help with the Hajj committee before I got that position. Like I used to make the presentation for them. I would make flyers for them. I would go and do workshops for them and all this stuff without having anything to do with what I'm going to get except what intention that I want to do for sake of Allah. And I promise you, at that time, Allah gave me every single thing. Even when I came to this community and the challenges that you face as you director and imam and such, my heart itself, anytime I had the worst day here, if I had, it was always when my intention was not about serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was serving my own ego. And I've noticed that. Every time when I'm calm and saying, you know, Ya Allah, this is for you, I'm trying to get your forgiveness. So I can go to Jannah and I'm hoping that one individual from this halaga or that halaka benefits. SubhanAllah, that's all. Every time I do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored me. I'm relaxed. I don't even care what's happening in the world. I'm doing my thing and I'm doing it well.
subhanAllah, intention has so many different things, so much, so much impact. Your work, when you go to work, you say Bismillah. Look at how amazing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, right? When you say Bismillah and you get in the car and you go to work, you're getting good deeds for it. If you open up Zoom and you are doing work for the sake of Allah because you're going to feed your family so you can do better and the risk and all this stuff, charity and all this stuff, you're getting reward for it. If you just have the intention, Ya Allah, I'm doing this for you. If I eat Bismillah Rahman Rahim and you have an intention, Ya Allah, I'm eating this so I can worship you better, it's reward for you. And look at how amazing this is. Again, should actually connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more, right? That our deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take our deeds. And if you had an intention of something good, which is the hadith, we know how the deeds are calculated. If you had an intention of something bad, and if you don't do it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually give you reward for it. For not doing the, the, you get zero for the evil intention, and you get one good deed for doing the good deed. And then if you had a good intention, and if you did it, you get one for the intention and you get one for doing the good deed. And if you had a bad intention and then you did a bad deed, you get one bad deed in general. Not for the intention, just for the deed itself. So how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so grateful. But then the fourth one, if you had a good intention, but the action doesn't happen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give you the good deed exactly the way you want it to be so if you are living now and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you all let's say i'm not here tomorrow allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highest companion i leave the world if i have the intention of ramadan now and even if i don't make it allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow me to enjoy the fruit of ramadan in my grave because i had intention of it to so make the intention of doing deeds that you're going to do in a month now a year now Umrah now. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes it down for you. This is such a benefit. Why not take use of this? Yeah. Um, another benefit of this is look at the stories of the prophets. The benefit of having the you know intention of the taqwa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intention. The sea was split for Allah subhanahu for Musa alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look at the intention of Maryam alayhi salam and look how Allah protected her. A baby spoke to to better uh, to you know protect their honor. So Allah subhanahu wa taala cooled the fire for Ibrahim, and there are so many alayhi salam and so many stories. Intentions are always there because their intention with Allah subhanahu wa taala, Ya Allah, I want to serve you, and Allah subhanahu wa taala honored them because of that. It's so cool. Lastly, I believe it's what is intentions. Uh, what is the class? I think we covered this. And how to achieve ikhlas. We didn't cover this. Did we cover this? A good way uh, how to achieve ikhlas. Uh, I remember Sheikh Mundur telling me this one time. Um, it's, it's really doing stuff when nobody is there. Like waking up for tahajjud, reading two rak'ah or uh, praying two rak'ah of tahajjud at night. Why, why, would this, why would you say this would build ikhlas? The reason it would build ikhlas is because you're doing it when you don't have to, it's voluntary. You're doing it when nobody can see you, right? Unless you go and you tell everybody the next day, of course. Um, but you're doing it when nobody can see you, everybody's asleep, and you're doing this, like it's very hard for that action to be other than for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, because you're doing it at an inconvenient time, you're inconveniencing yourself. If you have work the next day, that's even that's even like a greater jihad against yourself. So doing those actions that are very hard, those will get you ikhlas and around nobody else as well. Anyone else has a suggestion about how to achieve ikhlas? And this is the last slide, and we'll end inshallah in the next few minutes. Second class. Tahajjud, by the way, uh, one other thing Sheikh Yasser Bajaz uh, once told me, if you can't get up and pray, just get up on your bed, like just get you know yourself up, your back up, and just sit there. Or just wake up and just think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
you can't, you know, we go from zero to 60 in three seconds. Here, idea, take baby steps. If you've never done a hajj, uh, your family is not used to it, it'd be very difficult for you to start. So start with one thing. If you can do that, start with just getting up on the bed and just thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his nature and everything that's around us. There are a few suggestions there are, which is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is taqwa, which is taqwa is not, is God consciousness, you know, being God consciousness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demands sincerity. Um, the easiest way to, you know, to give one of the examples, any action you're trying to do, like even for salah, before, like when sometime we're talking in the hallway and we go right into the masala and we will, Allahu Akbar, give yourself a minute. Give yourself 60 seconds. Don't make it like a bid'ah. I'm not saying, but give yourself some time. Think about it. Hey, I'm doing this for the sake of Allah. I'm doing this for the sake of Allah. At night, weekly, if you want to do it, put a reminder on your, um, on your phone and it says, listen, I want to see, am I doing this for the sake of Allah or I'm doing it for someone else? Just do a review of things. If you're part of a position, if I doing, are you doing for the sake of Allah? How can you correct course? And the best thing you can do, inshallah ta'ala, is to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you what, if you feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you every single thing. To achieve ikhlas, I would say big da'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be sincere about it and be, ya Allah, I want it. Be like a fakir, be like a beggar. And be, ya Allah, I have nothing. You ask Allah like this. You cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to you. You know, people don't like it when we cry in front of them. Some people are okay with it. Some people, most people are not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like, that. he loves when people cry to him. They nag to him. I have a cat, subhanAllah, who will go in front of the balcony door and will just stand, just sit there. Just sit there. Because he knows at one point I'm going to give in and I'm going to open the door for him. Literally, the most patient cat I've ever seen. It will not try to touch the handle, nothing. For five, ten minutes, it will sit there just because he knows that I will go and open the door if I is persistent. Same way you want to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be persistent like a child who cries to the parent all the time. Ya Allah, uh, ya, ya, oh my father, my mother, dear, give it to me, give it to me. And those who nag to a point that you just want to get it done with, like, you know what, go get it, get lost. Like that's the level we're trying to do, and this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Who would the who among all the who actually ask for one time and they just leave, or someone who asks and nags and all this stuff has a better chance of getting it? So nag to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you can. That's one way to achieve a khlas, inshallah ta'ala. Um lastly, I will end with one of the verses, poetry from one of the uh uh Imam Ghazali's poem. This is something he mentioned about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I love this because he has such a beautiful way to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I want to end with this. Because you know, there's no better con other than the Quran, I saw better poetry like this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he reads this, it's just the two of the excerpts. And it says, Allah knows all knowable encompass, is all, all things is knowable encompassing. All that transpire between the depth of the earth to the end of the universe. Nothing of an atom's worth in the earth and the heaven escapes his knowledge. Rather, he knows the creeping of a black ant across a soundless stone on a lightless night. He knows the movement of the particles on a windy day. He knows the hidden and what is beyond. He presides over the thoughts of the conscious and the movement of the separation and the recondite, I think it says, subtleties, okay, of the psyche with the beginningless internal knowledge that has been with him forever. SubhanAllah, Allah SWT is aware of a leaf, not a leaf that drop, and Allah is aware of that. So please ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for this, for your sincerity, for, and I hope you had enough content to understand why sincerity is important in ikhlas and how to achieve it. If you want to start, definitely start with Surah Al-Ikhlas. There's a reason for it, it's called sincerity because it grounds you. Honestly, I think we made a mistake here. We should have talked about it a bit. We can't be sincere with other action until we're sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have we actually thought about Allah is one? And how is Allah is one? And you have this argument done in your mind that if there are two gods, it can never work. 
If God was not self-sufficient, it would never work. If the God had to ever sleep, it wouldn't work. Which is that's why Ayat al Kursi is there. So have that sincerity of understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, that would develop that then with du'as, with little actions here and there, do one action but consistently, and then that would develop your sincerity and ikhlas with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You do one thing, you read one verse in the morning, or you read the, the du'a that we're reading, subhanahu wa hamdi, or the du'a for the which is we're trying to do for the, the coronavirus. Any of those du'as you do, Inshallah, do them. When you do it one and you do it over and over and over, subhanAllah, you will develop that ikhlas, inshallah ta'ala. there's anything else wants, somebody wants to add, please add. And from, I'm done for today. Um, but yeah, jazakallah khair. Anyone else, Sister Ilham, Sister Brother Faris, Brother Mahmoud, um, anyone else has anything to add to this conversation? Sister Sunda, Sister Lubna, Brother Muhammad. Also, if anybody has any questions. Yes, questions, comments, concerns. I also know, oh, is the content useful? Or oh, is it on point for you? I'm pretty big on uh, not wasting people's time. So was it a benefit for you all? Yes, alhamdulillah, jazakallah khair. I wanted to add something real quick here, um, just at the end. People, they usually get this uh, intentions thing a little, um, how do I say that? Like, they get it a little um, confused, maybe, because we have people, especially nowadays, where people are like, oh, don't judge me. Like, you don't know what's in my heart, right? And of course, this is not saying that we do know what's in your heart or anything like that. Um, we shouldn't use like, oh, what's in my heart as an excuse to not do something, right? So we shouldn't say, oh, I have a good heart. Um, Allah knows what I feel, so I don't have to pray. Or I don't pray, I'm not, it's, it's okay for me not to pray because I know I'm a good person and Allah knows what's in my heart. Because we do see a lot of that, especially nowadays where people are like, oh, don't tell me what to do or don't tell me how to do this or you don't know what I'm doing. Even if they're doing something completely wrong, people are afraid to take advice or they're afraid to be told uh, what they're doing what, or what to do because they think that their, their, um, their intention is 100% sincere. Right. If we do have 100% sincere intention and our heart is 100% sincere, our actions will reflect what our heart is. Right, and it goes to the verse, right, to the gap. That people will come and says, "Oh, if somebody comes that I had intention, um, the deeds in the day of judgment, if they're not with the right intention, it wouldn't work." Same thing here. If you don't have de if you don't have actions, you have intentions, that doesn't work either, right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, like there are things that you have to do, and you cannot, like as you mentioned, there are other examples. Again, I think it goes back to. If uh, the two verses of the actions are judged by intention, uh, intention and uh, actions are judged by their completion, because if you put them both together, I think that's what happens. They take one part of the hadith and they don't take the other one. And they don't think about the completion part. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's like they say. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, like, it's a balancing act. Like, in the a'malu bin Right? right? Verily, the action, you have to do an action, and that intention for that action is what you're based on. Not, in the middle, uh, I don't even know how to say it. In the middle, it's not like that. It's because it's, right. you have to have the action and you have to have the intention for that action for that intention to be judged. Definitely. Not the other way around. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, I appreciate everybody for being part of this and Jazakallah khair for your feedback. Inshallah, we'll do our best to improve. And next week, Inshallah ta'ala, it is on. We're going to show off in Riyadh. Yeah, we'll see if we can. Because I think jealousy and Riyadh and showing off, they're very, the three big things. And we'll see if we want to change that. If you have suggestions, please uh, put them in the comments. Um, also, Fadis had a suggestion that in Ramadan, we do this right after Fajr. So think about it for this week and let us know next week, inshallah, what do you think? So in Ramadan, we're thinking to continue this. 
as well as we're going to do our tafsir of Surah Al-Fatih, inshallah ta'ala, um, for the four on Sundays, and uh, we'll get you know the times, inshallah ta'ala. So think about it next week. We'll continue this at the same time. Uh, Jazakumullah khairan. Everything that was good that was said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the mistakes are ours. And it's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing us to do this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us ours on the right intention. Brother Faris, could you please end us with dua? And Jazakumullah khairan. It was very great to see you all. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم إني أعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن نفس لا يشفع ومن دعوة لا يستجاب لها بسم الله الذي لا يضر مع اسمه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء هو سميع عليم الحمد لله وآخر دعواتنا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت سأغفرك ونتوب إليك جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته